Welcome to Crime Watch, live from Television Centre in West London. This is your chance to help with the fight against crime. These are the teams of police officers, senior investigating officers drawn from all across the United Kingdom who've come here with their cases to Crime Watch tonight. Seated here, people from Cheshire, from Hampshire, South Yorkshire, Cambridgeshire, Worcestershire. There's the West Country, the West Midlands, there's Northern Ireland and North Wales, among a lot more besides. All have brought serious crimes which they need your help to solve. Coming up on the programme tonight, the white gunman with goofy teeth, the black man and the Asian woman. The trio who threatened to shoot children. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The Friday night joyriders who are terrorising Belfast. We watch the police pursuit and show how you can help to put a stop to this. This is sort of damage. This is what happens in West Belfast every single night. And poached eggs. Why the police and wildlife groups are joining forces to stop these from being stolen. First, the death of Hannah Foster. It's now two weeks since the 17-year-old was killed after a night out in Southampton. In that time, police have found some significant new clues. And this evening, as we reconstruct the night of Hannah's death, we can tell you about some of these new leads. See if you can help find Hannah's killer. <laughs> Hannah was always a very happy person, one of those sort of children with a ready smile. And she's just, you know, that expression people say about flourishing into a young woman that was what we were witnessing it's just the sort of girl that you just always felt very proud of i first met her in year seven at school she was lovely she was just always there for me if i needed her and she was a great listener and would help me if i had any problems or anything we decided we'd go out on the friday so we got ready together can I get a double vodka and lime and lemonade? Yeah, that's yes. Can I get two? Yeah, no. And that was all we had for the whole night. We didn't have anything else to drink. Yeah. Cheers. That Friday, it was comic relief, and a local band called Afterglow were playing in the bar downstairs. But Hannah and her friend Helen went to sit outside. She was currently studying for the four A-levels and she just had a set of results which were straight A's again. Have any of you guys heard back from any news yet? Um, yeah, I heard back from a nursing one in Leicester. Oh, we're going to do nursing? Yeah. Oh, right. I'm going to medicine. She did a week's work experience in hospital last summer and she just adored it, thrived on it, and that just confirmed for her that that was, that was definitely what she wanted to do. All right, then, I'll see you later. Bye, bye. Bye. See you. Are we going oh, on sure. like a move? Yeah. We decided to go to the Sobar yeah. to see if there were any of our other friends down there. Go to Lennon's They only spent 10 minutes in the Sobar. Hannah and her friend had then planned to go on to a club, but decided against it. We were going to go to Lennon's but we decided not to because everywhere had been really empty, so we didn't think any of our friends would be there. Should we just not bother? Oh, yeah, OK, come on, let's go home. We walked through Portswood, which is just full of shops, and we walked along a main road, so there's normally quite a few cars passing. And then we waited at my bus stop, and then when we saw it in the distance, um, Hannah said that she had start walking now, so we said goodbye. Bye. Bye. Police need to speak to anyone who got on at that stop or who was already on the bus. They may be vital witnesses. I could see her just approaching Shaftesbury Avenue and she turned around and waved at me and I waved back. Hannah's short walk home should have taken her down Shaftesbury Avenue, Richmond Gardens and onto Grosvenor Road. We don't know how far she got, but a witness heard screams and the sound of a car. It's the, the not knowing what she's been through and the imagination and just knowing how frightened she must have been at some stage and we can't get beyond that. 
At 11 o'clock, Hannah dialed 999. She never spoke to the police operator, but her conversation with a man was recorded. She may still have been on the street, but the police think it's more likely she was in a car and dialing without her abductor's knowledge. I instinctively knew that there was a problem when I woke on Saturday morning. She'd never, ever failed to communicate. Once she, she came home later than we anticipated without telling us, um, she could see how worried we were about it. And after that, she always made sure that she, if she was going to be late, if she was going to go later than she told us, that she got in contact. It was a very, very terrifying and frustrating day because we knew Hannah. We were well aware that the police had had people say before, we know our daughter, she wouldn't run away from home. And it was just one of rising panic. I actually wanted to physically go and smash down all the doors in the neighboring houses. And it was just a, a very long, very terrifying day. But by the time I went to bed on Saturday night, I was certain that she was dead. And Sunday was just a, a numb day, I think, is the only way I could describe it. On Sunday afternoon, Hannah's body was found four miles from her home. She'd been strangled and dumped in bushes by the side of the road. On being told, I think I immediately said, I need to see her. But something reassuring must have been said to me to make me think this is definitely Hannah they found. Um, we've just been inundated with letters, flowers, cards. I think it's, it's really the people around us, the friends and the community and, and the police help that we've had that have, have pulled us through and given us that strength we need. This is Detective Superintendent Alan Betts of Hampshire Police. Alan, this 999 call that Hannah made that she tried to make, what can you tell us about it? It's very difficult to discern exactly what is said on the, the tape recording. Um, it's clearly a male voice, and from what we can make out, it appears to be a stranger to Hannah. Um, we're trying to do our best to enhance it. And you're appealing tonight for an Asian man or Asian men, possibly, come forward. Yes, there's two separate occasions when Hannah mentioned to her friends that there was a, an, an Asian man or an Asian men, um, you know, two, two different people, who'd um, called her by name near her home. Um, we're just trying to identify who they are. Um, it's quite possible or probable they have nothing to do with this offence. What can you tell us about a motive for Hannah's murder and, and how she died? Well, we now believe that the motive was sexual and that uh, she was strangled and uh, left in Allington Lane um, after she'd been killed somewhere else. Um, we're appealing to anybody who might have an, any idea of where she may have been assaulted. It's possible she was taken to a, a lover's lane or a, a dark area and members of the public might have seen somebody there um, and dismissed it as a lover's tiff or something like that. So it was after 11 o'clock on that Friday night, which was comic relief night, of course. That's Someone right. may have heard something strange, may have seen something. Now, the new lead, or one of the new leads you've got tonight is this connection to South Sea in Portsmouth. Yes, um, I mean, it's about 25 miles away from Hannah's home. Um, we found her bag at a glass recycling centre in Portsmouth, and we now believe that it was left in a um, bottle bank in South Sea somewhere after 6 o'clock on the Saturday morning. And someone, someone was seen putting uh, what we believe was Hannah's bag in a bottle bank there. Yes, we've got a vague description of a, of a male seen putting um, what, a cloth of material, which would appear to be Hannah's bag, in a bottle bank uh, that morning, and we're obviously trying to find out who that might be. It may be there's a perfectly innocent reason for, for putting it in. Somebody found it and put it there. So we obviously appeal to anybody who did put a bag in a bottle bin to come forward. So the thing is, who do you know who had a reason to be in Southampton uh, at around 11 o'clock on the Friday night and then had a reason to be in South Sea in Portsmouth between 6, 8.30 in the morning, the following day, the Saturday morning. If that gives you any ideas, if you have any clues, call us here in the studio. The number is always on the bottom of the screen, 0500 600 600 or call the instant room on 01256 406 469. You can also email us. Just go to our website at www.bbc.co.uk slash crime. Murders of young women like Hannah make headline news for the very reason that they're pretty unusual. 
In fact, more than two-thirds of Britain's murder victims are male, and six times more people are killed each year in road accidents than homicides. But, of course, there's something especially upsetting about murders of women, and these are the appeals that tend to get the biggest response from Crime Watch viewers. Last Friday, a year after her disappearance, Millie Dowler was finally buried by her family in Walton-upon-Thames. Surrey police are still anxious to trace her school uniform and bag. Also last Friday, the body of the Finnish student, Suvi Araman, was found in East London. A man was arrested on Monday. He's been charged with her murder. And we've progressed on both of the separate cases, Marsha McDonnell and Margaret Muller. We appealed for help in finding their killers in last month's programme. Our reconstruction of the murder of Marsha McDonnell led to more than 220 calls from Crime Watch viewers with clues to both that and two other attacks in southwest London that have been linked to it. One viewer gave police a description of a man seen around the time of the first attack on a girl in Strawberry Hill, three weeks before Marsha was murdered. Thanks to this information, police have been able to release this EFIT. The mouth is missing because the witness couldn't describe it in detail. But do you recognize him? If so, give us a call. A total of three men have now been arrested in connection with the attacks. Margaret Muller, an American artist living in East London, was stabbed to death in Victoria Park in Hackney. We appealed to anyone who was in the park that morning to attend a reconstruction staged by the police to identify further witnesses. Following the event, two men have been arrested. Now, back a little further to our programme last November. We showed CCTV from a train journey in West Sussex. An attack on a man left him unconscious and with serious head injuries. Following a call from an off-duty police officer, British Transport Police have arrested and charged a man with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. Again from November's programme, we appealed to find the killer of Salik Chowdhury. He was the man stabbed in front of his seven-year-old daughter on the doorstep of his home in East London. Three weeks ago, four men were arrested in connection with his murder, independently of the programme. But police are renewing their appeal for witnesses there's a £10,000 reward. What I hear from the National Crime and Operations Faculty is Detective Sergeant Jackie Haynes. Two clips now from CCTV and another piece which prove that you don't always need an elaborate system of security cameras to catch events on tape. Sometimes all you need is a family camcorder. But first, the CCTV. Most towns and cities have some kind of security camera system, but not all as sophisticated as this one in Cambridge. Here the cameras can zoom in and track suspects. In January it picked up on this pair. One of them smashed a bottle against a wall and then acted aggressively towards these two men. The CCTV operator tracked their movements and managed to get us great pictures of their faces. Can you tell us who they are? We'd also like to talk to them about a robbery against a student shortly after this. We think these two may have North England accents, possibly from Tyneside. Next to Streatham in South London and a violent robbery last October at this small store. This man came in brandishing a short scaffolding pole and started to attack the shopkeeper. He struck him several times around the head and then took cash and phone cards from the tills. Tell us who he is. And now that home video taken by a vigilant resident of a small village in Worcestershire. He noticed two men he didn't recognise at the home of his elderly neighbour. She rarely had visitors, so he was immediately suspicious and started filming from his own front room. Later that day, the neighbour realised she was missing some cash. We really need to talk to these two men. Do you know them? Call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Now some detectives looking for a very dangerous and rather distinctive trio. There's a goofy white man, there's a stocky black man and an Asian woman. And they are so aggressive, they held a gun to the heads of two small girls. The crime took place in Tipton in the West Midlands and somehow the trio knew that one night back in January the father had brought home from business a very substantial sum of cash. So it's not an ectopic? I've got two children, uh, married and 
Just a normal, average family. You know, kids go to school, meals from work, so I stop at home all day, housework and, you know, looking after the children. Mum, do you know where the turkey slices are? In the fridge. Holly, you got your PE kit? It's in the back room. We were sitting watching television. Uh, that was it, really, just chilling out. Is that On that Tuesday evening, a neighbour was also watching telly, but was distracted. I just saw three figures walk past the window. And it's very unusual for anybody to walk sort of round, because it's like a, a cul-de-sac, so it's unusual for people to walk that way. So I got up, looked out the window, couldn't see anybody, because they'd already turned the corner. Is somebody coming? She, she just stood there. It was just like a tense moment. I just looked and thought, oh, it's unusual for her to just stand there, not say anything. Oh, oh, it's gonna go. Get out. Get out. Well, I jumped up, went to the door to try and push it back. As we, he come through the door, uh, his mask wasn't on properly, he's like twisted, so he lifted his mask up to pull it on right. And I got a good look at him. He got bulging eyes, like um, crooked teeth, like sort of thing, horrible teeth, and uh, like a thinnish face with a pointed nose. Give some money! Money! I wouldn't have thought that he'd have thought I'd got any money here because I never usually carry money here. And that's why I says I've got no money. <laughs> turn over, turn around. <laughs> Don't mess with us. We're from the Burger Boys. I was really frightened. I thought he's either going to cut my throat or slash my face, do something, you know, sinister. Um, I was really, like, really scared. Really, I just wanted to protect my family. Give some money! I wanted the gun off him, so I just went for him, like. With extraordinary resourcefulness, the ten-year-old hid inside a cupboard and dialed 999. She was calm, but the noise behind is so distressing, we can't broadcast the recording. Well, with a gun to me door, said I thought I feared the worst. I thought, just in case he did shoot or anything, so I didn't want to do nothing else. I just wanted him to get out the house, like. Daddy, I'll get the money. So with that, I run upstairs. When my wife was on the stairs with a, another chap with a knife to her throat, <laughs> and I went up and just fetched him the, the money. I was pretty frightened. I was frightened. Who would hold a gun to a small child's head? Where's the jewellery? They were all family possessions, but most distinctive were two Egyptian necklaces belonging to the children, like army name tags but made of gold, and the writing is in Arabic. He tried to cock the gun back. And that's when I thought that he's going to try and shoot. Holly, keep the door closed. He's trying to get at my daughter. Husband, God, you've got to hurry up, please. The women roll with the ears because they've got a gun in the... And now Next thing I know, I heard him run down the stairs and heard the door go. And I automatically run after him. I ain't got no shoes on, I'll just run him down the street. I saw a woman just running, not, not sprinting, but like sort of slow jogging. She kept looking back, like behind, behind my house. And I thought there's something wrong, like she raised my suspicions, and I thought there's something wrong.
What's going on? The bastards have robbed me. They've got a gun. I was mad more than anything. I was... I think it was a bit of panic, a bit of madness, a bit of everything. Around 8.30 on Tuesday at the end of January, did you see an odd trio on the run? An Asian woman, maybe 30, a white man with pointed features and bad teeth, and a tall and stocky black man in his 20s. That's the guy who's looking for them, Detective Constable Adrian Smith of West Midlands Police, and I gather, Agent, the two girls, the children, have been remarkably resilient. They have, Nick. Um, it has been a shattering experience to the family, uh, and I must say, in 20 years that I've been in the police service, I've never known uh, quite an incident taking place before where children have been sort of held at gunpoint. I, I suspect that anybody watching this, even people who, who are part of the criminal fraternity, um, have never experienced anything like this and won't have any truck with these guys anyway. And presumably a lot of people will know who they are, won't know what violence was used. Yeah, well, I mean, let's face it, these people, they've got brothers, sisters, workmates, drinking partners. Yeah. Somebody's going to know who they are. Um, and hopefully if we get the right call, he'll give us the lead we need. Now, the white guy, when the, you know, he took his mask off, as it were, yeah. and you've got a good description, this goofy guy with bulging yeah, eyes. Yeah, distinctive bulging eyes, um, goofy... Uh, dirty teeth, uh, protruding teeth. And quite tall. Quite tall, skinny, um, and quite distinctive, I'd say. Uh, the, the black guy, described as fairly tall, actually, later, you've got the evidence tonight, you think he's probably at sort of average height, about five foot nine. Yeah, but, I, I, but I believe stocky. so, yeah. The girl, now, the woman, maybe a little older than we showed in the reconstruction, maybe 30, in her 30s, or even, even slightly older, she might not have known what had happened, might not have realised how much violence there was. If she comes forward tonight, can you offer her protection? We can do. We have got uh, witness protection um, available to us. Um, and should she like to put herself forward and give us some information, obviously we could consider that. Now we've since discovered that the family jewellery wasn't kept in a plastic bag, but in a plastic container just like this, which belonged to one of the kids originally, I think. Um, what's the significance of this? Um, on its own, significance is negligible, really. But uh, if it is offered in conjunction with the items shown in the form of drawings, well, then it does become, obviously, okay. very significant. Particularly those distinctive tags, gold tags with the girls' names in Arabic. We need to find these attackers pretty quickly. If you've got any idea, give us a call, either here in the studio or in the incident room on 0121 626 1683. And incidentally, maybe on a broader scale, you can help reduce the number of guns in circulation. Next month, across Great Britain, there's a gun amnesty. So if you know anybody whom you suspect has a firearm that isn't registered, tell them to hand it in to their local police station. Now, you might think that's far-fetched, but last time there was a gun amnesty, in 1966, 23,000 firearms were handed in. You can find out more about it at our website, that's bbc.co.uk slash crime. Now, Operation Issa, this is Alexandria here. She's an 11-month-old peregrine falcon, and she's here with her handler, Jemima. Jemima, welcome, and thanks for bringing Alexandria in. This is normally the sort of crime we tackle on Crime Watch, but Alexandria and Jemima are here because of a joint initiative between police across the UK and the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. There are only 1,300 breeding pairs of peregrine falcons like Alexandria still in the wild here in the UK. And they're one of 75 species of rare breeding birds who are being targeted by people who steal their eggs. They're known as eggers. And right now is the breeding season, so police are asking Crime Watch viewers to help them with the campaign. This man was caught by a special RSPB camera in April last year, stealing the eggs of the chuff, an extremely rare species of bird. There are only 300 breeding pairs left in the wild. It happened at an old quarry building near Conwy in North Wales. Do you recognise him? The problem has become so bad that the activity of eggers poses a threat to the long-term future of these birds. And tonight, Peter Charleston, who's the North Wales Police Wildlife Liaison Officer, and Graham Elliott of the RSPB, would like Crime Watch viewers to help catch the eggers. Now, Graham, we've got some of the eggs here that you recovered that have been stolen. Why would anyone want to steal these eggs? I think serious egg collectors are essentially trophy hunters. They're driven to take and possess the eggs of rare birds. So do they get money for them? No, there's no financial value involved at all. But it is real, a real serious problem to the survival of some of our most interesting scarce species. And they all, they all write their, their kind of collector's mark on yes, them? Yes, you so. often find this sort of coding written on the side of the egg, which gives you a clue as to when and where the eggs were actually taken. Now, Peter, this is a, a serious crime, isn't it? 
definitely this is a serious policing issue. We're talking here about dedicated egg collectors. We're not talking about youngsters out collecting eggs and we're not talking about opportunistic egg takers. Over the past couple of years there's been a number of people who have been sent to prison for these offences and that shows that the courts are also taking the issue very seriously. So how widespread is the problem? Well, we believe that there's about 300 of these dedicated egg collectors uh, throughout the country. And we think that partners and friends... Well, <laughs> Alexandra's outraged at that comment, <laughs> she's flapping her wings in protest. Yes, yeah, so we think the partners and friends are aware of who these people are, but perhaps don't understand the seriousness of the issue. And they just think it's a, a harmless hobby. That's right, and we're appealing for information from them as to who these people are and indeed where they're keeping their egg collections. So, Graham, apart from uh, birds like Alexandria here, what, what kind of birds are endangered by this, uh, this kind of crime? Well, I think an excellent example is the chuff, which was featured in the little video clip earlier. There are probably about 300 pairs restricted to Western Scotland and Wales, and it's a bird that we are concerned about. There are other examples, like the white-tailed sea eagle, for example, only 20 pairs now on the west coast of Scotland, and each year maybe one or two pairs are robbed by egg collectors. And then another example would be the osprey, very much sought after by egg collectors. 125 pairs, mainly in Scotland, but one or two at sites in England. OK, well, let's see what we can do tonight. Remember, these aren't kids stealing eggs for fun. These are adults who know they're committing a crime. It's a serious crime. Call here in the studio or call North Wales Police if you can identify that man we showed there on 0845 607 1002. The legacy of the troubles in Northern Ireland means that many people are still suspicious of authority. But tonight we're appealing to help stop a crime that's causing a lot of unpleasantness and death. This is Andrew Jones Little. He failed to appear in court after a pedestrian was seriously injured by a stolen car. Do you know where he is tonight? We also hope families are going to call in with other names. And this is why. Last year alone, 7,000 cars were stolen in Northern Ireland. And in three years, 11 people have been killed by so-called joyriders. It's an old problem, and it's caused great grief and resentment. My brother, Patrick, he's my only brother. He was killed by a stolen car on the 24th of January, 1999. My 15-year-old daughter, Debbie McComb, was killed on the 1st of March last year, so she was. And it has just turned my whole family's life upside down. You know, I'll never get over losing our job. Neither will his daddy. When they get behind the wheel of a car, they are potential killers. Car crime is a big problem in Northern Ireland, but particularly in West Belfast. This music is part of the community campaign to try to end a conspiracy of silence. The, that is the car criminals treat the ordinary residential streets of West Belfast as a racetrack, and out they go night after night, stealing cars and injuring people, terrorising them and even killing them. Because the joyride culture is so entrenched, last year the new police service of Northern Ireland set up an auto crime unit. Some of the 40 officers on this operation need to be warned of the dangers. Recent information suggests that criminals may try to ram armoured and PC cars um, and have actually done in the past as part of these operations. The control room has two police cars at its disposal, four unmarked cars, a spotter plane and five Land Rovers. This is basically the normal patrol vehicle for West Belfast. Certain areas, certain estates will throw bricks, not, not just at police. I mean, they throw them at fire engines, they throw them at ambulances, buses, but they will throw them at police and rovers as well. A brick from uh, one of our supporters, obviously. Later that night, in a different vehicle, police arrive at a petrol station as two boys speed off in a runabout, a cheap car used by joyriders with no tax or insurance. That's the ghost car going. The aeroplane is locked on to the car now. Yeah. And we'll start to get other call signs start to move in towards us. And without hesitating at all, no brake lights, he's just gone straight through red lights there. He didn't care at all who was coming at the other junction. Watch the bumps. The police can't drive dangerously like the joyriders, so they pull back. Straight on up, because uh, we nearly got something there, but uh, the aeroplane will keep an eye on it. And uh, if we get an opportunity, we'll come back to it. A recovery team has a full-time job picking up the remains of cars joyriders have left behind. So as you can see, fairly well wrecked. 
Um, fairly well damaged the whole thing. This was somebody's pride and joy. This was somebody's car. And this is how it'll be finished off. The control room reports a stolen car has hit a police Land Rover and is now racing along the Mona bypass and heading okay. for Peter's Let's unit. They have seconds to deploy a stinger. Here he comes, here he comes. Good man, did you get him? No. A very wide road. All the police vehicles are starting to close in on him. He's gone over the curb, he's gone straight over the pavement. We can't do that. No. Okay, is that into a cul de sac? No, back on the Alder Street towards uh, country. Clear, Scout's got him. He's gonna crash. There Scout's he goes. got him. He's Scout's got him. Close he's down. Close down. Close down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There'll be runners. There'll be runners. There's one person still in here. How bad is it? Do we need an ambulance? One stolen car. One so-called joyrider sitting in the back of this. Well done. Well done. He's got a bit of bad wind in the back of his head there. This is sort of damage. This is what happens in West Belfast every single night. Those sort of operations together with community pressure have been pretty successful. They've helped to cut car crime by about a third. But this year, even so, a lot more kids are likely to be killed and many more pedestrians or motorists in Belfast are going to get hurt. If you know who's doing it, please tell the police. And tell us who this is. This is one of the lads from the petrol station. Help us put a stop to all of this. 0500 600 600 or call the auto crime team on 02890 Fiona. Well, let me just update you on the calls we're getting in so far. We've had a lot of calls on the murder of Hannah Foster. One in particular, I've got it here, uh, which is linked to Southie. And if you remember, Hannah's bag was found in, um, it had been dumped, uh, the police believe, uh, in a bottle bank in Southsea in Portsmouth. We've got a very good sighting here of someone who thinks they saw the bag in the right area near uh, the bottle bank. So we're going to be following that up. The Tipton burglary, if you remember the, the uh, children who were held at gunpoint so horrifyingly, uh, five names have come in for that. Some very good information. Uh, in particular, one very good call from a police officer uh, whose, whose uh, information about the, the people that we identified matches them very well indeed. The Streatham grocery rob robbery. One person who's rung in who believes he knows exactly who did it was just going off to check a bit further. Please do call us back because we very much want to hear from you. Um, any information about any of those, about any of the stories we're featuring tonight, please call in. The studio number's on the screen. If you're watching on digital satellite television, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset, handset and choose Crime Watch. Coming up, can you help catch the fans who started one of Britain's worst football riots? <laughs> And the day jewel thieves disturbed the peace of a quiet Surrey town. Don't really move and you won't get hurt. People say unsolved murder cases are never closed. In fact, of course, not many are actively investigated after almost 40 years. One is, though, and after four agonising decades, the victim's family is tonight pinning its hopes on you and on other Crime Watch viewers. And so is the community where it happened. A small village in South Yorkshire where the crime is still talked about as though it happened yesterday. Anne Dunwell was 13 and was brought up in Whiston near Rotherham with her grandparents and her sister Irene. We had a very, very good upbringing with a lot of love in the family. I'm going round to Auntie's for the night. All right, love. Here, take these with you, can have them for your tea. Um, get me purse out and get a shilling. She was quite quiet, like music. She thought the world of a grandma and granddad and my dad. Um, she loved going to stop at my auntie's in uh, Howard Road. See you tomorrow, Gran. OK, love, bye. Anne took a bus to Bramley, some three and a half miles away, and spent a few hours playing out with friends. Though she'd intended to stay the night, she changed her mind. Bye. No one's really quite sure why. I'm going home to Grand's. Okay, I'll walk up the road with you. 
Maybe it was because her granddad was working nights and she didn't want to leave her grandma on her own. At any rate, what happened next is being unraveled by a detective who's been analysing decades of child murder. Abduction and murder of young adolescent female of this age is quite rare in so much as that we've only had about 102 cases over the past 42 years. And if you look at Anne in the circumstances of this crime, she only decided to make the journey that she was undertaking 15 minutes prior to leaving her Aunt Irene's address. That tells us that who's ever committed this crime is an opportunistic type of offender. Anne went up Cross Street, but as she sometimes did, it seems she then went past the bus stop and began to walk the three and a half miles home. She was almost halfway there when she was seen on Bawtry Road. It's likely she was grabbed soon afterwards. There is almost a 70% chance overall of the offender being known to Anne. We're talking about someone that's acquainted with Anne because they see her in the area, they know her. Anne would probably be totally aware of the dangers of strangers, but wouldn't necessarily be aware of the dangers of acquaintances. Nobody knew that she was missing. My auntie thought that she'd gone back to my grandma's, and my grandma thought she was at my auntie's. That night, a farmer saw a grey or green minivan parked up near the old windmill at Carr. In fact, it's known as Windmill Lane, or Lover's Lane. Was this the killer? And did he know the place because he'd brought girlfriends here before? I know from the research that I've done that this offender would have been 16 to 40 years when Anne was killed and will now be 55 to 79 years of age. We sincerely believe that the offender is likely to be at the upper end of that age scale because the profile of car owners and drivers in 1964, they were much older than they are today. Four hours later on the same road, a car's headlight swept past something white. The driver wondered what it was, but it was only next day when he heard of what had happened that he realized he must have seen Anne's body. It was discovered early the next morning. At a quick glance, I thought I saw a body. So I carried on, went through to work, parked my van, and the, I worked for the brother-in-law at the time, and I said to him, Bill, I'm sure I've seen a body. He said, right, jump in the car, we'll go down and have a look. I didn't go right up to the body, about eight feet away from the body. I thought it was a, a, a blonde lad. But apparently it was a girl. It really knocked me back, it did. Anne had been sexually assaulted and strangled. In all probability, Anne was able to identify the offender. She more than likely was able to identify the vehicle and therefore needed to be silenced, so Anne was probably killed to silence a witness. As soon as I saw uh, the policeman at the door, I knew they took us to um, identify Anne's body. That I will never, ever forget. Um, I remember seeing the bruises round her neck. I remember the bruises on her face, and that will stay etched in my mind forever. Later that morning, Anne's clothes were found dumped in Ali Reservoir, some six miles away, on a route that goes to the A618, broadly in the direction of Anne's home. When offenders commit this type of offence and they take items from a victim, they are generally deposited during a journey that the offender has to undertake. It may well have been that the offender was on his way home when he deposited the uh, clothes in the reservoir. I still hate whoever did this terrible thing to my sister. She didn't deserve to die like that. She had a lifetime. We've served the life sentence. But of course, uh, a killer has gone free until tonight. Detective Superintendent Ernie Roper of South Yorkshire Police wants anyone who lived near Rotherham in 1964 to think back to the murder and Ernie, 
that's going to be pretty easy for people around there to do. Yes, it, it affected the lives of thousands of people in 1964 and it still does, it really still is in their hearts and minds. And a lot of people who lived in that area are now scattered across the country with their families. This is the compendium, the report that the police at the time did. And the investigating officer then, the senior guy, was convinced it was a local man. You're equally convinced. There, there is absolutely no doubt the strong local connections in this case indicate to us that, that the offender lived or worked in that area. He knew that ground very, very well. And now you've recovered DNA from the clothing. Yes, it's a quite a simple process to give a voluntary DNA sample. It's painless, a simple mouth swab. And of course, I don't want people to worry about naming individuals. The, the names will be given in the strictest of confidentiality and we will go to people to eliminate them and not try and point the finger at them for killing Anne. So what sort of people are you hoping going to ring tonight? Well, anyone with any information, people can put things together about a man who had a vehicle, Which lived in the Which was not that common at the time. 1964, not many people would have had access to, to a car. In fact, the police had hardly any cars in That's the area That's right, the yes. But this man had access to a vehicle. He lived in the area, knew the area well. He was a violent man. He demonstrated that with the, the way he treated Anne. People will know him as a violent man. He'll have previous, previously committed offences, maybe not convicted, maybe not reported to the police, but I want people really to put all these facts together. And there's another thing, I know you've recovered some bacteria which suggests you had a sexually transmitted disease, which of course other sexual partners would have known about. Exactly. That bacteria was found on the same item of underwear that the DNA was found on, and I'm absolutely convinced that people can put all these facts together, phone in tonight, and please give us the name. Have you been able to identify the particular disease? Yes, it's gonorrhea. So, a woman who had a sexual partner in that area, who had gonorrhea, who had a vehicle, who fitted in terms of violence and all these other things. There's a lot to go on. He may have even boasted to associates. OK, well, uh, if there's anything that you can piece together there, anything at all. You've heard how easy it is to eliminate somebody. It's really just a matter of going and asking them if they mind to give a, a mouth swab. Many, many men have already uh, agreed to do so. It isn't a, a problem. Just give us a call. Our number's on the screen. And uh, several of Mr Roper's colleagues are here in the studio. Or you can call the incident room on 01709 832 689. Now here again is Detective Sergeant Jackie Haynes. With four faces for you to look at, all being sought by my colleagues across the country, can you help? Firstly, Frank Searle is wanted for failing to appear at court in Exeter last year. He was charged with aggravated burglary and kidnap after a violent incident in January 2002. A man was robbed in his home and forced to hand over his valuables. Police know he's worked as a labourer and scaffolder on building sites in the past and he has family and associates in Exeter and West Country areas. Where is he now? Daniel Gilmore was due to appear in court but has skipped bail. He was charged with conspiracy in connection with an attack in Liverpool in November 2001 when a man had his hand cut off with a samurai sword. If you may remember actually we reconstructed that case last year and police now believe Daniel Gilmore is somewhere in the south of England. He's an ex-member of the Irish Rangers Regiment and may be in touch with the family of army friends from Catterick, Yorkshire or Canterbury in Kent. Perhaps you could tell us something more. And detectives need to talk to Lewin Gotchi about a murder in East London. A man was stabbed to death in a flat in Bow last October and Lewin Gotchi, who, who's originally from Kosovo, has not been seen since. Now my colleagues on the case say he's potentially dangerous and I do caution viewers not to approach him, but if you know where he is, please tell us. And finally, Anthony Sheik. Police want to talk to him about a rape and an indecent assault against two boys. Anthony Sheik was living in the Lambeth area of London, but we know that he travels a lot, so he could be anywhere right now. Again, he's violent, so please don't approach us. Just call us here in the studio if you know where he is tonight. We're getting some very good calls, good information on people who are stealing eggs of uh, endangered birds of prey. One person who's wrong in says he knows someone who's doing it in Wales. You haven't left, I don't know if you're he or she, you haven't left your number, please do call back. We really want that information. Your call really does count. Two of the cases coming up were wanted faces we showed on Crime Watch, and both for court, thanks to viewers phoning in with information. And have you seen this man? He's Martin Williams, and he's wanted in connection with the abduction. In July last year, we showed you a photograph of lorry driver Martin Williams, who is wanted by Avon and Somerset police for the rape of a young woman in Bristol. Unusually, we also included a description of his lorry. Its registration number is P834RWR. 
On the night, several viewers called in about the lorry. They'd seen it parked outside a home in Bristol. Police went straight round the address while we were on air and later arrested him. Martin Williams was found guilty of rape and is awaiting sentence. Next, some faces you might know. Lynn Wright failed to turn Lynn up. Wright was jailed as the direct result of information given by a Crime Watch viewer. In February last year, detectives in Wrexham were looking for her after she failed to turn up in court. We couldn't tell you at the time, but she'd swindled acquaintances out of nearly £40,000. A viewer recognised her and that call traced her to the Featherstone area of Wolverhampton. She was arrested there last June. She was charged with 11 counts of deception and has served 10 months in prison. This time last year, we showed you CCTV from a bank in Birmingham. Police were trying to trace this woman, who'd ordered a checkbook on someone else's account and was caught on camera trying to pick it up. West Midlands police needed to know who she was. Over 20 viewers told us she was called Lisa and often visited Crayford Dog Track. One gave us her full name, Lisa O'Keefe. Last month, she was found guilty of deception. She received a two-year rehabilitation order. About 10 months ago, there was one of the worst football riots ever seen in Britain. It resulted in 157 police officers being injured. These are just six of the 800 people police believe were involved. And here is why they badly want to find them. It all started at Millwall Football Club in South East London. Millwall had a crucial game against Birmingham City. And with Millwall losing, many of the fans started taunting and barracking the visiting supporters. At the end of the match, the Birmingham fans were held inside the ground to avoid a confrontation. But many of the Millwall side were spoiling for a fight, and as they spilled out into the street, they started hurling abuse and throwing missiles at the police. The rioters had a combination of tactics. Some of the rioters would actually sort of get a group of about eight or nine of them together, you know, with holding some sticks or, or, or missiles, and they would run at the police lines and then get really close and then fire off at fairly point blank range these missiles and then run back. Part of the crowd had come prepared with large fireworks. It soon turned into a full scale riot involving 800 people. Others would sort of be prepared to stay back and just be part of what I would call the baying mob, you know, jumping up and down. If the, the mob went forward, they would go forward. If the mob went back, they would go back. Well, there was 157 cops injured and about 25 horses. Out of that, the worst injured, we had people with broken sternum, broken arm, lacerations that needed stitching. Some were detained in hospital. Around 80 people have been arrested. Police now need to find the rest. Incidentally, sentences have so far totaled over 80 years in prison and over 300 years in football banning orders. We really need to find the others. Please tell us about this lot. Ring us here now, or you can call the incident room direct on 020 7230 1697. Now, an appeal for stolen jewels. The town is Cobham, Surrey quiet, genteel kind of place. So on a Saturday two months ago, as shops were closing, three rather furtive figures stood out. The police were even warned about them, but too late. shop's about to be robbed. I'll just set the time for you. Okay. I was in the jewellers um, on that Saturday um, to collect my watch, yeah. which had been repaired. And whilst I was collecting it, I decided to change the strap, so it was taking longer than we had thought. It was about quarter to five, and that is the sort of time when everyone's winding down. The high street gets empty, so you sort of start thinking about what you're doing for the rest of the weekend. So it was a, a hell of a shock when, when this under the door just slammed open. <laughs> Arm three! Nobody move and you won't get hurt! It looked like a shotgun, and his hand was inside the plastic bag. Hit the panic button. I can't, I'm too far away. Just let them take it, nobody do anything. Well, obviously, I was concerned for everyone's um, well being, and that's why you sort of say, everyone calm down. And everyone does, and everyone just stands there shocked. The gunman's stocky, late 20s, medium height, 
with dark pockmarked skin and a silver ring in his left ear. All we could hear was a racket from the other side of the shop um, with all the, the showcases being torn open. The second robber's younger, early or mid-twenties, and taller, perhaps six foot. He's also very dark. Because I couldn't see what was going on, I thought, they've got a gun behind me. They, they're, they're ready, they're waiting to shoot me. I could see Shirley through the workshop window, and she, I think, could see how terrified I was, and she tried to calm me down by mouthing to me, it's OK, and, you know, it's all right. And the more she did that, the more I thought, they've got a gun against my head. I was absolutely terrified. I've never, ever felt in fear of my life like that before. The two windows they actually went for um, were the main value windows of the shop. A lot of diamond eternity rings, a lot of um, fairly sizable single stones, all diamonds and platinum, diamond necklaces, quite a lot of handmade goods and some rubies and sapphires and stuff like that. Passers-by saw three men run out of the shop and a fourth behind the wheel of a black BMW. Get the number. T716 Mud. The number plates were false. The police arrived, but after the BMW had gone. Take a look at the EFITs. Three of the four robbers are in their 20s and probably come from London. If you're offered what they've stolen, it's hot. Some they can pass off, jewellery like this. You can find in most places eternity rings, that kind of thing. But some are more unusual. Take a look at this sapphire and diamond pendant. It has a distinctive maker's mark, MJR which is the jeweler's stamp. And this ring, that's a 19-carat yellow sapphire surrounded by diamonds. Pretty hard to miss. But it's not just theft we're talking about. The robbers were carrying what looked like a gun with an implicit threat to kill. If there's a bang or somebody drops something, all of us are immediately... You know, we're all quite frightened still, I think. I think even though everyone, everyone else has dealt with it really well, there is still, you know, the memory in their minds of that bang as the door opens. Give us a call, ring the incident room on 01372 478 381 or call Crime Stoppers anonymously if you want on 0800 555 one. Just had a chance to spin through some of the calls that are coming in. Two intriguing ones on the Hannah Foster murder. Two separate witnesses have called Cromart saying they think they saw Hannah in a hatchback with a man. The biggest volume of calls has come on that appalling robbery in Tipton with a gun pointed at the little girl's heads. We've got so many names on this one and uh, something that really looks quite interesting. We may have disco discovered one of the pieces of jewellery and uh, on the Ar Anne Dunwell murder. We've got a call which is really interesting, too interesting to tell you more about at the moment, but we will, I hope, find out more and tell you later. All the numbers for all the police forces are on CFAX on page 621, and don't forget you can see the details of all tonight's cases, plus crime prevention advice, on our website. That's at bbc.co.uk slash crime. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and again this Thursday and Friday from 7.30 in the morning until midnight. We'll be back after the 10 o'clock news with the Crime Watch update. Always say if that's after your bedtime. Don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.